On May 14, 1804, Meriwether Lewis and William Clark set out on what would become a two-year expedition across the western half of the United States. The journey, known popularly as the Lewis and Clark Expedition, but later given the name the Corps of Discovery, covered more than 8,000 miles, surveying the newly purchased Louisiana Territory from the Mississippi River to the Pacific Ocean. During that time, the expedition members suffered through harsh weather, extreme terrain, injuries, illness, and occasionally violence. Through it all, only a single party member died. Though the men failed to identify a possible Northwest Passage water route from the Mississippi River to the ocean, they did manage to produce invaluable maps with previously unknown geographical information, identify at least 120 new animal species, and gather 200 botanical samples, meeting dozens of Native American tribes along the way. Upon their return, Lewis and Clark were hailed as heroes, their reception so grand that it was often compared to that of early astronauts. Brave adventurers overcoming and surviving the wilderness of a place unknown by all others. Yet for all of the successes of the Lewis and Clark expedition, there lies a shadow over the legacy of the famed Meriwether Lewis. For as this daring explorer was able to survive the treacherous journey into the vast wilderness of North America, his life came to an end not long after his return. A tragedy with mysterious circumstances that over two centuries later remains unsolved. My name is Brandon Schecksnyder, and you are listening to Southern Gothic. On September 4th, 1809, Famed explorer Meriwether Lewis departed St. Louis, Missouri for Washington, D.C. For the past two years, Lewis had been serving as the governor of the Louisiana Territory, and this trip to the capital city was not only for political reasons, but also an attempt at reimbursement for debt that he had incurred while serving in this role. Debt that could potentially decimate his personal finances if it went unpaid. Lewis was accompanied on this journey by his personal servant, John Prenier, a free person of color who had previously worked in the White House during Thomas Jefferson's presidential administration. Also tagging along was Lewis's dog, a Newfoundland named Seaman. For a week, the men traveled south down the Mississippi River before arriving in New Madrid, Missouri, where Lewis visited the local courthouse to make a will, dated September 11, 1809. This will stated that in the case of his death, all of Lewis's possessions should be left to his mother after all of his debts were paid. The men then continued on to Fort Pickering near present-day Memphis, Tennessee. But upon their arrival on September 15th, it became clear that Meriwether Lewis was not well. Captain Gilbert C. Russell, the commander of the fort, reported that the crew of the boat Lewis was traveling on informed him that the governor 
had made several attempts on his own life while on board, and one of those attempts had nearly been a success. As a result, Lewis, who was sadly said to have been in a state of derangement at the time, would require two weeks to recuperate fully before being able to travel once more. It was at this point that Meriwether Lewis changed his travel plans. Initially, he planned to head south down the Mississippi River to the city of New Orleans, where he and Pernier would board a ship to take to Washington. But now, it was decided that the men would travel overland along the Natchez Trace to Nashville and continue eastwards from there. Several reasons for this change in plans were given. One, that the governor wanted to avoid the humid climate of New Orleans. And another, that he feared his papers, which included the journals from his famous travels, might fall into the hands of the British as they sailed the coastal waters. Either way, the decision to travel along the trace was certainly a riskier one. Two weeks later, when Lewis finally left Fort Pickering on September 29, 1809, he was joined by several men, including Indian agent Major James Neely, who had arrived at the fort several days after Lewis. Neely intended to escort Lewis to Nashville, bringing along his own unnamed personal servant, as well as another unidentified man provided by Captain Russell who would assist in hauling the two trunks that contained all of Lewis's papers and journals. There's been some debate over what occurred over the following days, specifically whether or not the men traveled east to the Natchez Trace or instead headed southeast to the Chickasaw Agency in what is now northeast Mississippi. But either way, on October 7th, the day after the men crossed the Tennessee River by ferry, Major Neely separated from the group. In his own reporting of these events, he claimed that several of their horses had strayed or disappeared from camp, and not wanting to delay the governor's travels, the Major went in search of them while the rest of the men continued on. Unfortunately, this would be the final time that Major James Neely would see Meriwether Lewis alive. On the evening of October 10th, 1809, Meriwether Lewis arrived at Grinder's Stand, a log cabin located about 70 miles from Nashville that served as sort of an inn or trading post for travelers along the sparsely populated Natchez Trace. Upon his arrival, the owner of the place was not at home, but his wife, Priscilla Grinder, welcomed Lewis and his men, providing them with food, a room for Lewis to sleep, and accommodations for his men. When questioned in the days following, Mrs. Grinder said that Lewis behaved oddly, claiming that he, quote, walked backward and forward before the door, talking to himself. Eventually, however, Lewis went to his room, Priscilla Grinder and her children to theirs, and the servants outside to sleep in the barn. But several hours later, these men and women were awoken in the dark, early hours of October 11th by a pair of gunshots. Meriwether Lewis had been shot in the head and abdomen and now lay dying in a pool of his own blood. Within hours of Lewis's death, Neely caught up to the group 
arriving at Grinder's stand completely unaware of the tragic events that had occurred. The Major then took responsibility for Lewis's body and buried him nearby before questioning Mrs. Grinder and the servants about what had happened in the early hours of that morning. Neely then took possession of Lewis's belongings and headed north to Nashville, arriving one week later on October 18th. There, Neely composed a letter to Thomas Jefferson informing him of Meriwether Lewis's death, detailing the journey and the information he had gathered about that fateful night. It is with extreme pain that I have to inform you of the death of His Excellency Meriwether Lewis, Governor of Upper Louisiana, who died on the morning of the 11th, and I am sorry to say, by suicide. Years later, Thomas Jefferson wrote what is considered to be the most definitive view of Meriwether Lewis's death as a part of the biographical document that serves as the introduction to the published Lewis and Clark Expedition Journals. But this account is based heavily on the information provided to him in that letter from James Neely, who wrote, The woman reports that about three o'clock she heard two pistols fire off in the governor's room. The servants, being awakened by her, came in, but too late to save him. He had shot himself in the head with one pistol, and a little below the breast with the other. Yet for all of the information provided about the explorer's death, many still question Neely's account, for not only was Neely absent on the night in question, but there were no direct eyewitnesses to what the men deemed a suicide, leading some to question if Meriwether Lewis might have in fact been murdered. Meriwether Lewis was born on August 18, 1774 at Locust Hill Plantation in the colony of Virginia near the present-day Ivy. He was the third child and eldest son of William Lewis and Lucy Meriwether. Then, after William died of pneumonia in November of 1779, Lucy remarried and the family relocated to Georgia, settling along the Broad River in what is now Oglethorpe County. Meriwether received no formal education until the age of 13, but he did in fact spend his time in Georgia learning and refining his skills as an outdoorsman and hunter. Then, upon his return to Virginia, between the ages of 12 and 14, Lewis interacted with native peoples for the first time, specifically members of the Cherokee whose land was being increasingly encroached upon by white colonists. It is reported that Meriwether wanted to aid the cause of the Cherokee, but at the time was still too young to be politically effective. It was during this time that Lewis would also begin his formal education, and under the guardianship of his uncles, he eventually graduated from Liberty Hall, now known as Washington and Lee University in 1793. The following year, he joined the Virginia militia before enlisting in the United States Army, where he served until 1801. By now, it was clear that Meriwether Lewis had a passion for adventure. Longtime family friend, Thomas Jefferson, recognized this in Lewis, and after appointing the young man to the role of secretary to the president, on April 1st, 1801, Jefferson tapped his young protege to lead a grand expedition across the continent. Then, when Meriwether Lewis returned from this two-year journey, he was rewarded with a political appointment, the governorship of the Upper Louisiana Territory, a position he held to the day of his death. <laughs> 
Today, most historians agree that Meriwether Lewis died as a result of self-inflicted gunshot wounds to his head and abdomen. But since he left neither suicide note or a witness on the night of his death, the evidence supporting this comes from secondary sources. Many note that although shocked at the news, Lewis's two closest associates, William Clark and Thomas Jefferson, did not seem surprised by the manner in which his death is said to have occurred. Upon learning of his friend's passing from a newspaper article, Clark wrote to his brother Jonathan in a letter dated October 28, 1809, quote, I fear this report has too much truth, though hope it may have no foundation. I fear the weight of his mind has overcome him. My reason for thinking it possible is based on the letter which I received from him at your house. It is unknown what Meriwether Lewis had written to Clark, for the letter in question has never been located. But given that Clark received the correspondence at his brother's home, it is believed that Lewis likely wrote the missive sometime in September of 1809, just before leaving on what would be his final trip. Yet it is Thomas Jefferson himself who is likely the most influential figure on how Lewis's death is remembered. As previously mentioned, on August 18, 1813, what would have been Lewis's 39th birthday, the former president wrote a biographical sketch of his young protege for publication, a document that showed absolutely zero doubt that Lewis's life ended at the hands of anyone other than his own, acknowledging that Lewis suffered from what Jefferson called, quote, sensible depressions of mind. Jefferson also added that the constant exertion and mental fortitude necessary during Lewis and Clark's expedition had kept what he called the man's distressing affections at bay. But then after Lewis had returned to civilization and reestablished himself into regular life, the problem returned with force. This idea that Lewis may have seen himself as something of a failure is common. Although the Corps of Discovery expedition successfully covered thousands of miles of uncharted wilderness, the men were ultimately unable to achieve the mission's primary goal in locating the supposed Northwest Passage. Additionally upsetting was the failure of the trading posts established as the men went west, as the entire system had begun to fall apart before the men had even returned home. Then, Meriwether Lewis, the grand adventurer and outdoorsman, ultimately found himself stuck in a desk job. Lewis's described difficulty in re-establishing a civil life and the return of his bouts of depression were likely only increased by other problems he was facing at the time, which included significant financial troubles and pressure to publish his expedition journals. In addition, it is believed that Lewis may have likely suffered from alcoholism and was living with an untreated illness, possibly syphilis or malaria, both of which can cause cognitive decline in advanced cases. Lewis's behavior at the beginning of his final trip could offer some insight that the man was having difficulty. Before his departure, he began setting his affairs in order, ensuring that several of his associates were given the power to oversee his estate and distribute his possessions in the event of his death. Then, on the first stop after leaving St. Louis, he composed a will. The reports of attempted suicides came soon after, prior to his arrival at Fort Pickering. Unfortunately, the fort's commanding officer, Captain Gilbert Russell, 
did not provide any additional details regarding these alleged attempts or why they failed. Yet in spite of all of this evidence, it is said that Lewis's mother and immediate family never believed he took his own life. Instead, they believed like many still today that Meriwether Lewis was in fact murdered. Several reasonings have been given for the speculation. First, that Lewis was an expert marksman and if he had wanted to kill himself, it would not have taken him two gunshots to do it. And second, that Lewis had no reason to kill himself and everything to live for. After all, he had returned home from a grand expedition, was hailed as a hero, and then granted governorship over a vast territory. Of course, this particular theory is not only incredibly speculative, it is also in direct contrast to our modern understanding of mental health and suicide. Still, supporters of the theory that Lewis was murdered rightly point out that out of all of the supposed evidence of his death, there were no actual witnesses to the event, calling into question the character and actions of both Neely and Mrs. Grinder. Because in spite of the fact that Neely had been charged with ensuring Lewis's safe travel, the Indian agent was not present at the time of his death. Instead, he was off looking for missing horses, or so he claimed. Yet conveniently, despite having been separated for several days, Neely arrived at Grinder's stand just hours after the event. The legitimacy of Mrs. Grinder's story is also frequently called into question based on inconsistencies between three separate testimonies she provided about the tragedy over the subsequent 30 years. In the first, given to Neely, it was Lewis's servant, Pernier, who saw to the man as he lay dying but in testimony provided a year later to Alexander Wilson, Mrs. Grinder claimed she aided the dying man herself. Notably, though, her third and final testimony, given 30 years later, in 1839, claimed that as the darkness fell that evening, two or three men arrived to the house, also looking for lodging. In response, Lewis immediately drew his pistols, and challenged the men to a duel. While these inconsistencies certainly open the door to the possibility of murder, the question of motive still needs to be addressed. Those who believe Meriwether Lewis was killed typically identify three possible reasons. First, the rage of a jealous husband. It is noted that during his stay at the inn, Mr. Grinder was not in residence, and some speculate that the man could have arrived home, discovered another man in his house, and killed him in an act of jealous rage. The second possible motive is that Lewis was murdered by bandits. At the time, the Natchez Trace was still largely an undisciplined wilderness well known to be frequented by robbers and other ne'er-do-wells. But the downfall of this theory is that if Lewis was indeed targeted by bandits, the criminals in question failed to make off with any of Lewis's valuables. The third and most well-known motive, however, is that Lewis's death was a political assassination. Some theories even claim the involvement of disgraced Vice President Aaron Burr Others, that Lewis's journals contain secrets someone did not want publicized. And yet others, that Neely and Pernier conspired to make it happen for unknown reasons. But in spite of these motives and theories, for the four decades following his death, it was overwhelmingly accepted that Meriwether Lewis took his own life. 
It was not till 1848 that the idea of violent misdeeds rose in popularity, when the Commission of Tennesseans set out to honor the famed explorer by erecting a marker over his grave. As a result, Lewis's remains were exhumed and examined to ensure that the burial site and cause of death were accurate. This led several committee members to write, quote, it was more probable that he died at the hands of an assassin, end quote. Unfortunately, whatever evidence they gleaned from his body is unknown. It has been suggested, though, that the Commission of Tennesseans needed Meriwether Lewis to have been murdered as honoring a man who committed what they would have deemed an action of immense immorality would not have been right. A letter written by Captain William Clark's son, Major Meriwether Lewis Clark, affirms this as a concern. He wrote, quote, Have you ever heard of the report that Governor Lewis did not destroy his own life? This is an important manner in connection with the erection of a monument to his memory, as it clearly removes, from my mind at least, the only stigma upon the fair name I have the honor to bear. While most of these theories seem to be based on emotion and circumstantial evidence, modern historians have posited yet another reason for Meriwether Lewis's untimely demise. One that claims Lewis may have shot himself, not with the intention of suicide, but rather as a way of helping. Through Lewis's expedition journals, it is known that the explorer became afflicted with some type of illness. On November 17, 1805, he wrote of contracting, quote, a violent ague, which continued about four hours, and as is usual, was succeeded by a fever, which however fortunately abated in some measure by sunrise the next morning. Based upon these intermittent recurrences of the illness's symptoms, both during and after the expedition, it is believed through modern scholarship that the man was in fact suffering from untreated malaria. This disease is a parasitic infection transmitted by mosquitoes and begins with an exceedingly high fever and wrecking chills. And for those fortunate enough to survive the disease, they can often find themselves with long-term side effects of recurring symptoms, including, but not limited, to kidney or lung failure or even neurological deterioration. Today, there's a vaccine and antibiotic treatment for malaria, but in 1805, Meriwether Lewis had nothing, although it is known that he sometimes self-medicated with opium pills. If this were in fact true, Lewis's erratic behavior leading up to his death may actually have been the result of this deadly infection as both his mind and his body were likely affected. While two centuries have passed since the death of Meriwether Lewis, the mystery and drive to discover the truth has not dissipated. In 2009, descendants of Lewis's family began a campaign to exhume their ancestors' remains and have them examined in an effort to solve the mystery for good. While past DNA evidence has already proven that the grave is in fact Meriwether Lewis's, the family's hope were that if his skeleton's remains were intact, it could be analyzed to see if the trauma matches close-range gunshot wounds, as well as provide insight into his nutritional health, any drugs he may have been taking, and if he was in fact suffering from an untreated terminal illness. Thus far, however, their requests have been denied. Today, Meriwether Lewis's grave remains undisturbed near Hohenwald, Tennessee, as a part of the Natchez Trace Parkway, overseen by the National Park Service. There, 
the famed explorer continues to rest beneath the monument erected in his honor in 1848. A monument depicting a broken column meant to symbolize the tragedy of a life cut short, but has since become a metaphor for our understanding of Meriwether Lewis's mysterious death. My name is Brandon Schecksneider, and you've been listening to Southern Gothic. Southern Gothic is an independently released podcast with all content written and produced by Brianne and Brandon Schecksneider. This week's episode also includes a special guest voiceover by Jeremy Collins of Podcasts We Listen To a weekly podcast in which Jeremy interviews some of your favorite podcasters, focusing on the questions you want answered. Check the show notes for a link. You might even hear a familiar voice. Lucky Little Shacks.